Is your phone dying? Do you need a charger? Yeah, just pour in the charger. This, um, what's the date? 24? This April 24 city commission meeting will come to order, uh, Madam City Manager. Well, before we start, before we start, we've had some significant events happen in our country over the last week, uh, last Monday. Uh, there was a horrible incident in Boston where at least four individuals lost their lives, and then there was the event in Texas where I believe about 14 people or more lost their lives. Um, we had even some uh, individuals from the city of Tallahassee participate in the Boston Marathon. And thank God um, that they were not injured or hurt uh, in that incident. But there were obviously four others and many, many others that were um, suffered injuries during the course of that. And so I think it would be appropriate at this point in time if we just take a moment of silence to remember those in Boston, as well as the individuals who suffered uh, who lost their lives and, and were injured in Texas. Let's take a moment to do that. Thank you very much. Madam City Manager. Will you please stand and join me in the invocation? Heavenly Father, we thank you today for all of the resources you provide to us to be effective leaders in our beautiful city. This is the time of year to recognize and give thanks to our administrative professionals. This is Administrative Professionals Day, whose talent and abundance of skills are essential to our multifaceted operations. We count them as blessings as we carry out our daily duties. May our recognition of their work continue to inspire them, inspire us, and all of our staff to new sight new heights of service. In your name we pray, amen. Pledge, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, um, where are we, Madam City Manager? Any agenda modifications? Good evening, Mr. Mayor and Commissioners. We do have, um, well, we, I thought we did. We, we, actually, one. we actually don't have any. I thought it was 1.0 something. I don't see any. We do have a presentation to make, and we don't have any agenda mods. You have some things that have been added to the agenda since your last meeting. Okay. No I think we're on presentations at, at this point. I think uh, the Mayor Pro Tem attended a workshop, they attended a meeting, and in my stead, in, where was it, Chicago? I'm in, a, in Chicago, yes, it was the American Planning Association. Okay. National meeting. And uh, she would like to uh, uh, recognize those individuals who participated in that particular event. And we can do it from here on the desk or we can do it down there, whatever is appropriate, wherever you would like to do it, Madam uh, Pro Tem. Go ahead. Could you have the Star Metro folks who worked so hard for this award come up? Hello, Star Metro folks. Congratulations to our new director, Ivan Maldonado. Well, the first thing I want to, I want to do is reach, have them all reach behind and, and pat themselves on the back. <laughs> because they've been through a great deal of pain and suffering over the last two years since the implementation of the decentralization project with Star Metro. This, their work has not gone unnoticed. And this year, about two, I guess last week, in Chicago at the American Planning Association's national meeting, Star Metro received the National Planning Excellence Award for Transportation. There is only one of these handed out each year, and it's handed out to a local, regional, or state transportation project that exhib exhibits that exemplifies good planning in transportation. This has been a very, very challenging, I would say, transition. We basically had to take a bus system that had been in place for years and years and completely reorganize it. It was almost as though a brand new, a brand new system was in place. Nearly, absolutely everybody who 
use the system was affected. The drivers, the management, but the planning didn't just start two years ago. The planning was going on as long ago as 2004, whenever I was in the at the University of, at, excuse me, Florida State University Urban and Regional Planning Department. And so after many years of, of planning, of stakeholders groups, of evaluation, and then the big step came on July 11th, in, two years ago, 2011, and then there were, of course, a lot of bugs to work out. Everyone worked steadfastly. There was a tremendous amount of citizen inv volunteer involvement, um, not to mention the fact that every single member of the Star Metro staff was deeply involved. So uh, this is an award recognizing how hard they worked. And I want to give you a big hand for everything that you did. Because wait until a crisis occurred. We couldn't just wait until gas prices were so high that that was significantly affecting people's budgets and they were looking around for an alternative way to get back and forth to work. This was timely, it was probably overdue, and it was a major effort. So they have been recognized for that. So it is today my pleasure to formally recognize the Star Metro staff and our new director, Ivan Maldonado, and Brian Waterman, who's the chief planner at Star Metro. I'm going to hand them the award here, but the real award is absolutely beautiful. It weighs about 50 pounds, and they shipped it down to us, and we don't have it today, but it's a very beautiful award. Thank you. Uh, uh, Major Marks, uh, commissioners, Madam Manager, uh, uh, all the le leadership staff and the citizens of Tallahassee, uh, on behalf of Star Metro, I would like to thank all of you for the great support and guidance that you have provided us uh, to help us receive this award. Uh, we did not do it alone. It took a lot of work from citizens, staff, many volunteers, uh, great leadership from our commissioners, our leadership staff, uh, and, and we are very thankful for that. Uh, uh, surely the foundation for excellence in transit services has been laid during the decentralization of the system, but this is just the beginning. Our goal is not just to have the best transit system, but also one that meets the transportation needs of our citizens of uh, Tallahassee and those vis visiting our city. So I really appreciate each and every one of you. Uh, our staff, our planning staff, each of uh, our the members that were involved, uh, we, we definitely have a great team, and I'm very grateful, folks, uh, for all the support and all the help that you have provided and for, work, for the work that you do. Thank you so much. Thank you. While they're taking the pictures, let me uh, just make a, a couple of comments. First of all, this uh, new transition to this route system was, uh, in some quarters of our community, was not well received. Uh, however, uh, the staff down at Star Metro believed in it, and uh, I think the proof is the fact that now they've won this award. But the other thing I want to do is recognize the new director of our transit of Star Metro, Hi, Mr. Maldonado. Uh, Well, it's for a little while, but now he's going to direct Star Metro for us, and uh, we really welcome you aboard, and we look forward to working with you. Thanks, and all you, you got a good team already, so you can't help but look good <laughs> over the years, okay? Thank you very much. All right, next item. We are on item number eight, Mr. Mayor's citizen input on agenda items. Any? There are no speakers. All right, next item. Uh, we are on consent. Mr. Mayor, uh, before consent, just on announcements, if I could, I just want to let you know in the public, I uh, have a uh, board meeting tomorrow morning in Miami, so I'm going to be leaving a little early today. Hopefully, I'll make it through the meeting, but I might have to leave oh, early. Oh, shucks. I had to make it work. I'll move consent. Consent. Second. Properly moved and second. All in favor of the motion, say aye. 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 It passes unanimously. Next item. The next item is an introduction of ordinance, and the city attorney will introduce that item. Commissioners, we're uh, asking an introduction tonight of ordinance number 
0-17, an ordinance of the city of Tallahassee adopting amendments to the 2030 Tallahassee Leon County Comprehensive Plan, providing for severability and conflicts and providing an effective date. And we will, uh, at the same time, be scheduling a joint public hearing for May 28th, 2013, before the city commission and Leon County Board of County Commissioners. And that public hearing will be held in the county commission chambers would move the approval of the introduction. That, that uh, ordinance is introduced. Next item. The next item is item number 13.01, approval of joint city-county agreement with the ACES Center for Women and Girls for administrative support to the Tallahassee-Leon County Commission on the Status of Women and Girls, and also consideration of appointments to the committee. And commissioners, in September of 2010, Leon County created the Commission on the Status of uh, Women and Girls, and last month, as you recall, you agreed to partner in the Commission and approve $20,000 in funding. Today we're seeking approval of a joint agreement between the City, Leon County, and the OASIS Center for Women and Girls, which provides administrative support for the Commission. In addition, the report includes the names of individuals that you have individually indicated you would like to appoint to the commission, along with the name of two others for consideration of a total of seven appointees to the commission. I believe you've gotten a couple of emails this week from Michelle Bono. She sent you an update on the county um, appointments that were just made, <clears throat> and I think this item is now in your hands for action. You know, could we just, um, each commission has made an appointment, and maybe some of us don't know who the appointees are, and each commissioner who has made an appointment or suggested an appointment, could you just kind of let us know who they are so we'll all it's in the agenda. know who they're they are? The, uh, mm -hmm. yeah. We'll start at, oh, uh, it Jessica. It's huh? It's in the agenda. I've done that. Mr. Mayor, make a comment mm -hmm. on the item? This Go is, ahead. Go ahead. Thank you. Uh, one, I, I'd like to move uh, approval of the recommended action. And uh, two. Second. second. Thank you. Uh, two, uh, before, as this transition was happening, uh, probably a number of us got outreach to by a lot of people. And I was one of them. Uh, a lot of people saying, Will you support me? And I was thinking, Yeah, sure. <laughs> I'll support you before realizing we only get to name one person. And the list of candidates that came through were just remarkable. Haley, you, you're going to have a fantastic group of people to work with on, on all sides of this, just looking at the resumes of folks. Um, but there is one person in particular, and she's not on our list or on the last list, um, Miss Elsie Crowell, who was very instrument, uh, um, instrumental in the collection of data that went into the report this year. I know Haley has underscored the need to, to have working members of this committee. She exhibited herself as one of them. And so, although she's not part of tonight's package, uh, would just strongly urge her consideration for one of the remaining seven slots, um, given her previous work on the committee. Um, uh, and I know that's not a decision we will get to make. The committee jointly will get to make that. Uh, but I um, want to throw my endorsement, not only behind the folks who are recommended here, but also uh, behind Elsie. Why don't we, can we, is it appropriate to write a, some sort of a letter of endorsement for this individual from us to send to the committee? I, I don't mind, or if you wanted to just personally outreach to the person you're nominating, because um, okay. I think they'll be the ones who make the decision. Okay. All right. I think, you know, as I look at this list, I think everybody knows, has a good idea who's on that list. We have some of the members that are here uh, this afternoon. Mr. Mayor, if you would like to have them stand. All right. I'll have them. Uh, my appointee is Jessica Low Minor. Jessica? I don't see Mildred Hall, do I? No. My appointee is Mildred Hall, but I'd also like commissioners to introduce you to Jennifer Kalinske. Yep. who I strongly recommend her time and her energy and her expertise and her talent is well known to me. And also her interest in this topic is very, very deep and longstanding. So I'd recommend her for, she's here down as one of the alternative, well, not alternates, but one of the extra two. And I'd like to ask for your consideration for her in that position. Commissioner Gill. Uh, is, uh, is that me, Nick? Uh, my uh, nomination is for Ms. Julie Moreno, who is new to our community. Uh, she is the publisher of the Tallahassee Democrat and has exhibited great interest in this subject matter and I think will be an asset to the committee. Commissioner Maddox. Uh, my appointee was Paige Carter-Smith who uh, served as executive director of Florida Voice for Choice. 
executive director of the Florida Democratic Party, uh, was a Golden Award winner in Girl Scouts, and uh, served as uh, chief of staff to the mayor in, in this uh, government. And my uh, suggestion for the overall appointee was uh, County Court Judge Nina Ashinafi. Commissioner? Uh, mine is somebody that um, I have a great deal of um, knowledge of. Um, she's been <laughs> living in Tallahassee for 40 years. Um, prior to my joining the commission, whenever we went anywhere, it was a matter of, um, oh, you're married to Gail Stansbury Ziffer. Um, her involvement in the community is um, very, very long and very deep. And her um, commitment to women's issues is um, even far greater. And so um, in, in my three and a half years here, it um, been the first time I had the opportunity to ask her to serve on this, and she wholeheartedly, wholeheartedly accepted pending approval of this commission. I didn't know that Gail was born here. <laughs> <laughs> I, I didn't. I didn't give the uh, background of Jessica Lomine. She is currently executive director, I think it is, of the, Flor the League of Women Voters, and I think she's uh, working on a PhD that is very, very focused on this particular area as well. So that was the reason why I thought she would make an excellent appointee uh, to the committee. We have a motion and a second to adopt the to adopt us to approve the Joint City County Commission Agreement along with the slate of appointees. All in favor of that motion say aye. 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 It passes unanimously. Thank you very much. We look forward to your work. We really honestly do. Thank you. Before you go, um, would you please stand Robin Thompson. Robin is the current chair of the commission. And Haley Cutler is the executive director of the OASIS Center, which will be they'll be supplying the support. And they were between these two women here and their their colleagues produced that excellent report that we based our support on. Thank you very much. Thank you all Thank very, you. very much. We look forward to your work. Okay. Thank you. Next item. The next item is 13.02, presentation on the Change for Change program. And commissioners, I know that each of you are aware of the Change for Change program, whereby city utility customers can make a monthly donation on their utility bill to help address homelessness. At the request of the Quality of Life Target Issue Committee, the city has launched a public awareness campaign in partnership with the community to increase participation in the Change for Change program. In developing the campaign, staff learned that there are more than 550 children in Tallahassee that are homeless, making up 20% of our homeless population in the city. This campaign focuses on the needs of families and children with the goal of doubling the number of participants and the amount of annual contributions. Participants meaning people who pay into the fund. Michelle Bodo is here tonight to show you a video and tell you about the campaign yes. and what we learned from homeless children in our community about what they miss most about not having a home. This is good. This is very good. Thank you, Michelle. Go right ahead. Mayor and City Commissioners, City Manager and guests, um, occasionally we get to work on projects that really are close to your heart and this has been one that has been really, really meaningful. Um, as the City Manager mentioned, when we um, worked with some of the um, agencies that provide homelessness services and they talked about 550 children in this community that don't have a home. Um, like many people we've talked to, our question was, that doesn't seem real. Where are these kids? And one of the things we learned from interviewing children at the Hope community is that um, they work very hard not to be seen as being homeless. The school system has told us in every one of our city schools there are homeless children. Um, for the younger children, they think that being at the Hope community is somewhat of an adventure. Um, families go there for six months of very personalized care and assistance to, um, with 80% of their uh, the people at the Hope community moving into permanent housing. So we know there are solutions that work in this community and we were really honored to get to um, take this assignment from the Quality of Life Target Issue Committee. I want to also recognize Commissioner Gillum who was on this committee before it transitioned to this, um, now with um, Commissioner Ziffer and the mayor um, serving on this. But I wanted to share with you, we went out to the Hope community. These are children in our community. I, as again, I started to say young younger children because they think it's an adventure to be there, to have a playground and a place to stay and to be with other children. When you go to the Hope community, the teenagers and the middle school kids don't want anyone to know. They, it's a shame of homelessness and even the parents have talked about that people will react to you and say, oh well you must not want to work. And we've interviewed and talked with parents who have college degrees and parents who want to be working and want to be back in a home environment. So um, I want to share with you what we heard from the children.
550 children in Tallahassee are missing the simple joys of being a kid. missing the simple comfort of having a place to call home. Join the Change for Change program by simply adding a monthly contribution to your city utility account. For the cost of just a gallon of milk, you can help all our kids enjoy the simple, extraordinary things about just being a kid. Wow. Pretty powerful. The, um, the kids that touched us also were the older kids that said, um, and in front of each one of you, you have a comment on the card. We're using these cards to thank some of the folks helping us. And the comments on your cards are comments that the children shared with us at the Hope Community. Um, I know mean, oh, Commissioner uh, yeah, uh, Ziffer. Well, um, you comment earlier about the teenagers, mainly middle schoolers and high schools, high schoolers. Um, I don't think we fully appreciate the number of kids that are in our schools that sit next to students that have homes. Um, the one that I have um, says, when my friends talk about their mom not buying them a new shirt or iPhone case, I want to tell them, get real. I don't have a home, but I don't say anything because they don't want people to know. Um, and um, by contributing to this, and it's not much. You know, you can pick it. I, um, it's not a lot we're asking people to do on the utility bills, but that little bit can mean an awful lot. I think right now we're at 2% of our utility customers contribute, which is about $60,000. And um, I know we're making a big push down. We're, we're only projecting a 2% increase to bring us to 4%. I, I got to tell you, I think this community is better than that. I think our people and our citizens and our utility ratepayers will, will kick in more than that. Um, there are too many people that are suffering far greater than some of us think that how much we're hurting. And so I would encourage anybody that's listening to me now or reads the newspaper, sees some of these. These are real kids that don't have a place to live. And so treat, please, just when you get your utility bill, think about how little $2 a month or $4 or whatever it is, what kind of difference that'll make. And I want to share how simple it is. Um, every utility customer who receives a copy of their bill in the mail receive this with their April utility bill. On the back, all you have to do is put your name, your address, your email, because we do confirm that indeed you wanted to sign up for this, so you get an email confirmation. It then shows up on your utility bill every month, change for change, the amount you indicated. Um, and the, it is tax deductible, so you can take that off your taxes at the end of the year. The other thing that's important for people to know is that the city is only the conduit. It goes from us, the agencies, to, straight to the agencies, the folks that has help, uh, assisted in the past have been the Hope community, also Second Harvest. And we asked, well, why Second Harvest? They said, when families have to make a decision between food and rent, they pick food. So if we can give them some food and allow them to pay their rent, they can stay in their home. The other agency that I know you're all familiar with is the Capital um, Area Act, Community Action Agency. They do the same thing, assisting with pressing bills to allow people to stay in their homes um, and hopefully get back on their feet. So it's very simple. Um, at the direction of the Quality of Life Target Issue Committee, we kicked it off last week. We've had a lot of um, business, citizen, um, church, and synagogue involvement. And we're going to every group that will let us get out there and have an army of other volunteers assisting. We talked to the school board last night. There will be emails sent to parents. There will be emails shared with customers. One of the things that when people in the room say, well, what can I do to help? You all each got a nice stack of these. Right. Hand them to friends because what we find is that people are touched by the program, but then they get busy and they don't make the time to fill out the card. You can go online to talgov.com. Um, it took me about 20 seconds to put this in, and they immediately verify that you have been accepted. Um, since we launched this campaign last Thursday, um, we are now up to 94 participants. Um, it's about $6,000, so we're a little over 10% of our way towards our goal, which is to get to at least another 60,000. Commissioner, I know we'd like to get more than that. So we really want to try to engage people. Our media partners have been fantastic. Um, our business business partners, so we think there's a lot out there. And you're going to see, you may have seen as you came in, some of the, the cutout Ouch. figures. Um, and on the back of each one of them, as you see on the table over here, are more flyers. And we're going to see have those in the malls. We're looking to take them to Tom Brown, where all the people are out playing baseball. 
Anything we can do to get the message out of how simple it is to donate a few dollars each month on the utility bill that goes to help families and individuals in our community to get back into homes, especially these kids. Yeah, if I can add, and I want to do, um, thank um, Karen Moore for hosting our event, and um, her company has 100% participation, all their employees, because after seeing this, they all, they all jumped in. And I, and I want to add, and correct me if I'm wrong, if at some point you've made this commitment and at some point you choose not to, you can opt out. Correct. It's not difficult to do at all. And so if now's a good time, I would urge you um, to do so. Challenge people in your office or where you work or um, your friends to step up and just do a little bit because it's going to make a big difference. I wanted to also introduce Carrie Poole. Carrie is our newest employee in the communications department. Um, I have introduced her. People tell me I shouldn't do this as the new Bill Behenna, but you all know Bill was here for many years. Um, everyone says a nice... What an improvement. Yeah. Okay, well, there we go. Um, Carrie has been a great addition. Her first day on the job, we went and interviewed the children at the Hope community. So she said, what a job. What a great opportunity. She's going to hand out to those in the audience today one of the forms, and we have a box at the back. All you have to do is check it off and fill it in. I also wanted to recognize our city utilities. They're doing a great job. Every new customer is going to receive an email saying, thank you for becoming a customer, and would you also like to sign up for Change for Change? Um, starting May 1st, throughout the month of May, every call taker will ask citizens um, who call into utilities, would you like to join the Change for Change program? So they're working aggressively with us to make sure. Um, every e-bill going out next month in the month of May will have a promotion about that and also hopefully a follow-up email to invite them to take part. So great assistance from our utility partners. How often is the PSA plan and where? I'm just curious more than anything else. Well, when, when you're low budget, it is definitely a PSA, which means that we're begging for our media partners to assist us. Um, we have had Comcast already step up to the plate and, and volunteer over $5,000 worth of um, programming on Comcast and public service announcements. Channel 6, Channel 27 have both received copies and agreed to share it. Um, several of the radio um, networks, um, groupings, have also agreed to air that we've given them an audio portion. So we've had great support from the media, and we think really the icing on the cake is the personal Ask, and we're really trying to work that also with Rotary Clubs and Civic Clubs as well. I mean, I, there are two other comments I, I'd like to make. First of all, this fits hand in hand with what uh, we have been trying to do in the homeless community. Uh, I guess a couple of weeks ago when we had our meeting, I asked Susan for sure how do we really address this, the homelessness issue, and what is the best way because obviously we've been trying for the last 10 years or so to really make a dent. We have made some progress. And uh, we have made a lot of progress, as a matter of fact, but not as much as we all would like to. And her response was a very simple one. I said, what is the answer? And she said, permanent housing or housing transition. And so this, this will fit that very, very well, especially when you consider the 550 kids are not out there roaming the streets. They're not. They're in homes uh, with parents that are homeless. And that's where we get that count from. So if we can focus our attention as far as homelessness is concerned on housing, which is where we should, this, this really is very, very, a very, very good program. The other point, Michelle, uh, Michelle I, I had a phone call today with the executive director of the National League of Cities. Uh, that phone call, they told me that they have monies for medical care or medical help for children, and they have a program that they are in, that they can provide funds or resources for that. So please get with uh, while I'm thinking about it because I might forget. Get with them uh, in my office with Brad, and he'll we'll put that together. Thank you, Commissioner. Well, I just wanted to put a little perspective on this, and I, the the ask on the back of the card is two, three, or five dollars, and that's only twenty-four dollars a year, spread out over even if it's five dollars donation, that's sixty dollars a year, spread out over a monthly, you know, five dollars, which is really painless to everyone. And then I also wanted to share with everyone that I've learned that it's very easy to get on this internally, I shouldn't say this to the entire public, by just calling Reese Goad and asking him to put you on, and he'll put you on. You don't have to fill a thing out. So, good luck. I expect to see everybody Gillum. on the list. Commissioner Gillum. Yeah, I, uh, Michelle, thank you to you and your team for uh, this revved up effort, and to Commissioner Ziffer, uh, and to the mayor for going out and meeting with uh, the public, t you know, to expand awareness on this. I thought that the press conference uh, you all held, particularly the 
um, the young woman, and, I, and her name doesn't. Wendy. Wendy Rodriguez. Miss Rodriguez, uh, Miss Rodriguez, who uh, you know told the story of of how she was employed and then lost her job, and she had two kids in the IB program uh, at Rickards, and when her savings ran out, she had to leave from staying at hotels. Uh, and was fortunate enough to get a spot in the Hope community. And, you know, if, I, I, of course, my mind immediately went to these kids who were showing up every day for this rigorous program and IB. And frankly, it didn't have to be IB. Kids showing up every day, uh, having to be, you know, under the expectation that they're prepared to learn, they are well rested, well fed. Um, with little to no distraction other than having to worry about making their grades uh, and that her family was able to persevere through that and it you know it sort of uh, shakes the mind because a lot of us you know make up in our mind excuses around why people fall into homelessness uh, and um, this wasn't a person who was doing anything wrong she was doing exactly what was expected and a bad economy hit and fell on bad times and she found herself without shelter for her and her kids and so uh, strong endorser of this program. Uh, uh, my colleague, Commissioner Katz, and I were original members of this committee when we considered this. I only mention him because he's in town, and I know he's watching us, not. Uh, going to stop by. Hey, you were right, exactly. Uh, but, but a shout out to him and, and also to the um, um, uh, team, uh, the now defunct team, which I think is now known as sort of our area ministerial alliance who strongly organized for this effort and pushed for it uh, and wanted us to consider an opt-out program. Uh, and I have to tell you, I agree that our community is so much bigger than 2% or 4%. And I think if people just knew, uh, you know, they'd be more than willing to be selfless and, and contribute, you know, one, two or three dollars a month uh, toward this effort. So, um, you know, th that idea is also not lost on me. I think we should give this everything we've got and then consider what our options are after that. But thank you for your work on this. Great stuff. Uh, this is just information, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, next item. The next item is 13.03, approval of amendment to master sewer plan to include additional unsewered areas in unincorporated Leon County. Commissioners, this item is seeking your approval of an amendment to the city's master sewer plan. In February of 2010, the commission approved the 20-year master plan, which in addition to other components included an evaluation for servicing unsewered areas within unincorporated Leon County. As required by the City County Water and Sewer Agreement, the approved plan was sent to Leon County for review and approval. The County Commission approved the plan contingent upon it being amended to include additional unsewered areas in the county. There is no fiscal impact to the city to include these areas in the master plan. The original plan approved by the Commission reflected an infrastructure investment uh, plan of approximately $28 million over the 20-year planning period. I see that Blast is here, and I also see that John is here, and I was told that John had to go to another meeting. So I'll, I'll move the item. Second. second. Okay. <laughs> Properly moved and second. All in favor of the motion, say aye. 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 It passes unanimously. Commissioner Maddox is not here, but it still passes unanimously. Go ahead. Next item. All right. 13.04 is a discussion of a two-year extension to option agreement for sale and purchase with the McKibben Hotel Group. And commissioners, in 2008, the city entered into a series of agreements with the McKibben Group, uh, the hotel group, for the development of the Florida Block on the southwest corner of Monroe and Tennessee Streets. Included in this action was a three-year option agreement to allow MHG to purchase the 0.63-acre corner parcel which is identified as parcel A in your agenda materials for construction of an office building. In 2011, the city granted a two-year extension to this option agreement. MHG has requested an additional two-year extension at this time to carry the option agreement to April 30th of 2015. Staff is recommending the additional two-year extension with certain terms and conditions. Uh, I think you've been briefed on this item and Michael Parker can provide a short uh, overview of the recommended terms and conditions for the extension and to answer any questions. I'll move the item. Have. Second. Question. It's a question to go ahead, Commissioner. Yeah, could you, if you if you don't mind, just going over into the public record what the uh, moderated criteria are and whether or not there are any additional 
payments expected to the city for the continued reservation of this land? Uh, well, I mean, I'm glad you got the opportunity because there's one modification to the terms that are in your agenda item that I want to discuss, and that is, is what we're proposing was is the 130,000. For, take a step back. The, uh, just for purposes, you understand that the agreed upon um, option agreement would have them purchasing the property for $1.3 million. Um, what we were, they have put down a $130,000 deposit. Um, subsequent to us sending this agenda out and they contact us and ask us to reconsider whether we could allow that $130,000 deposit to be applied toward the purchase price if they, um, with the agreement that if they did not, then it would be forfeit during the term of the agreement. Staff are, are prepared to recommend that or add that to their recommendation. That's the only change to what you see in your agenda item where we said that it would not be, re that it would not be carried over. The second condition is, is that the M they will continue to have to lease from the city the parking spaces or pay lease payments on the parking spaces on parcel A that they are currently using until such time as they close on the property, the option agreement expires. And thirdly, that the option agreement will contain milestones that will identify steps that they have to take that they could, we can track to show that they are in fact taking due diligence during this two year period to, um, to move forward so that they can close on the property. So the initial 130 that was paid um, on this on the site, I sort of received that as a reservation on the land. What? How did you all uh, uh, consider applying that 130? I'm not sure why we would carry that any more forward beyond the five years that we've already had on it. Well, it, it's the 130 was based on 10 percent of the purchase price, mm -hmm. and so um, they have they have suggested or requested that we consider that that the value of the property has not changed substantially since the time that um, they made the $1.3 million that was originally um, set, price was set. And I've confirmed that with our real estate folks that that's still a fair price. So they're asking that if they were able, if they were to, if they closed, that we would allow that 130, which they have already paid to the city, be credited against the purchase price. So the updated appraisal puts the value of the land at what? Well, it, we haven't done, done a new appraisal, but the based on the most recent transactions, and I talked with Mark Bedoin, the price that we're talking about per square foot on this at the, at the 0.63 acres at 1.3 million is still a fair market price. The appraisal on this was done in 2006. Property values were probably reaching their, their highest point in the downtown and, and then depreciated and are now moving back up again. So that's still considered based on recent transactions to be a fair market price. Despite the new development that's going on catty corner to this lot? Well, think, yes, sir. So I would, I would um, be prepared to support the motion without this change. Uh, to it and reserve the opportunity to negotiate that at a later, you know, at a later point. Um, and I assume the motion that's made didn't include this application of the 130 toward the purchase anyway. It was just continuing the reservation of land for two more years. No, the, the recommendation did include, what was the recommendation related to the 130? Not the one on the item, well, not the one on this right, agenda. Modified, subsequent to that, my, our staff's modification of the recommendation would be to allow the 130 to be retained, uh, or a non-refundable deposit which could be used for uh, against the purchase price if they close within the extended option period. And it's right now what you have in the agenda item is silent on that issue. It doesn't say one way or another. Actually, what it says, right, our original recommendation was is that that money would not be carried forward and allowed to be applied towards the uh, extension of the option agreement. So can you explain why you had that position originally? We met when, when we met with the property owners. I mean, our original intent was is that the five years had expired and so that the, the, um, the, good faith money would be forfeited. The property, uh, since then, they have come and talked to us, and they, our, our primary motive behind this is to get the property developed. Sure. And so the I, they've indicated to us that they believe that if, if we don't allow them to apply this towards the purchase price, we're essentially increasing the purchase price by 10%. So if they were, if they, we allow them to use the $130,000 deposit in, if they purchase the property, then we will receive the original $1.3 million that we agreed upon. If they do not close within the two-year period, it is a non uh, then we retain the $130,000. So we, I mean, I guess my consideration on this is that we have now taken this off 
uh, anyone's ability to bid for this particular parcel, which is now cleared, that we have a future transportation project on, so on and so forth. There's a new development that is occurring catty corner to this, which I'm not a real estate person, but I would assume will impact the value of the land that uh, is around it. Um, are we going to readjust this 1.3 million up uh, if the value of the land increases in two years, or is it the recommendation that we allow that to stay static as well? If, if this option agreement that we've agreed upon, the $1.3 million purchase price, regardless of the $130,000 if we extend this uh, agreement. Now, I will tell you that one of the uh, milestones that we are looking in here will not allow the property owner to, to basically do nothing on the property for the next two years. And one of the things that they have discussed with us is the idea of looking at alternative uses for the property. Um, the original approved UPUD for that property calls for the construction of a 90,000 square foot office building, which um, they have indicated and we believe is correct, is would be extremely difficult to finance in the current market. So if they are going to look at an alternative use on the property, that would require an amendment to the PUD. And that would have to come back to you as a body to approve. If they were going to do that, then they will have to, under one of the milestones that we're proposing to put in here would be, they would have to have filed for that amendment to the PUD within 90 days of this, tra of this transaction. If they don't want to amend the PUD, but want to pursue the existing 90,000 square foot office building, within approximately two, nine months, they would have to have submitted the building plans to the city for that structure. So what I'm, I guess what I'm suggesting to you is they will not be able to sit static for the entire two-year period. There are performance measures that they will have to do along. If they don't meet any of those milestones, then the option agreement will terminate at that point. Hmm. Commissioner Ziffer. Okay, so let me propose something that might be just acceptable it. to um, a compromise. Nine months is a benchmark time period, correct, that is in what we're potentially going to approve. So if I could suggest that um, within nine months, at that nine-month anniversary from now, if they have not, um, and what was the milestone for again? I apologize. If they are seeking an alternative use that would require an amendment to the PUD, if, if, then they would have to apply for that within okay. 90 days of the approval of the extension. Days. Okay, so I'm, I'm willing to go the two years on the extension for the $1.3 million price, but at nine months, if they have not met that benchmark, the $130,000 stays with the city, which effectively increases the cost of the land to 14.3, correct? Excuse me, one point. One point, right. Yes. right. Yes. Four. Mm -hmm. So is that acceptable? It, it, is, it is acceptable. I, I do want to clarify, though, in nine months, they could choose that they don't have an alternative plan on the land, and then what happens? Well, then they would have to be pursuing, showing that they're making, that they are actually have plans in the process to build the original um, approved construction on the site, which is the 90,000 square foot office building. And, and what does that look like? Uh, I mean, my big consideration is here is that we have a corridor, a critical corridor that right now is under redevelopment. We have taken this off uh, for consideration for any of a potential development for three years and then we did an extension for two and now you're requesting another extension of two and by the way, let the initial amount uh, that we put into abeyance in the initial three, you know, three-year request be applied to the initial, you know, the, the ultimate purchase without an updated assessment on the value of the land, so on and so forth, which to me sounds really weird. Uh, and so I'm wondering what are we asking to be demonstrated between this point, uh, nine months happens and there is no uh, intended change uh, in the future then, plans. Then, then they would have to have submitted their initiated the plan approval process, submitted their plans so that they could um, get their building permits. So in nine months in action, one way or another will have to be re uh, demonstrated. Yes, in fact, assuming that they, that, and that's the assumption is, is that they are looking for no change in the use. In use if right. they were looking for a change in the use, then they would need to submit an application because they have to go through the PUD process within 90 days of this. Then I, I mean, I, I agree with uh, Commissioner Ziffer. Then my, uh, you know, I, I think a compromise position would be in 90 days for us to make the determination on that 130. I'm okay with that. I, I, give me, explain so, again to Wash. Yeah, mm -hmm. what you so just said. So let me make sure that I understand. What we're saying is, if there is no action to initiate a PUD change in 90 days, then we would do what? Well, 90 days is the marker for either for right. a PUD uh, change right. or making progress under their intended right. plan. 
And I think at that time, that would give us hopefully sufficient enough uh, 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 consideration that they're actually making movement on this right. site. And then we would consider whether or not we would attribute that $130,000. Oh, so you will make a decision at that point yeah, in time? Yeah, I just think it would be more prudent, frankly, at that time, at that point of demonstrated movement, yeah. rather than okay. carte blanche at this point. What, what happens in nine months? I'm missing, did I, was that not on there? I think it's it was the 90 days. It's 90 days, we're talking about 90 days, not nine months. And then just so I clarify, yeah. the 90 days is based on the assumption that there's a change in use that right. they're going to, to, to do. And, and, and I, I believe that is, that is the, the way they're going to pursue. Right. If they were not to pursue a change in use, then they would not have to do an amendment to the PUD, in which case they, it would be reasonable to give them a longer period of time to get their building plans put together and submitted. And that was the nine months. I, but then I'm, gotcha. I'm even consistent with the nine months. I mean, if that gives them maximum leeway for movement. Uh, but I, I just don't think we should at this point say, here you go. You don't want to make any decision on the 130 until we know what but they're doing. But to agree to the two-year extension with the benchmarks that are in the that are in the item, I believe that was the spirit of the motion. Okay. Does that cause any problems? No, ma'am. I think that's consistent with. I mean, essentially, we were going to basically say that if you didn't meet the milestone, then the option agreement terminated. We kept the we kept the deposit, and so I mean, our intent was is to make these milestones, and the developers agreed to this. That these are these are required steps and then if you do not meet them then then you're not meeting the terms of the option option agreement commissioner so it sounds like none there's not a lot of support for the one hundred and thirty thousand dollars being applied to the purchase price um, the question is that whether that is allowed to go forward w when we do act on this the city um, the city attorney has indicated that he thinks we have everything in place that we need Okay. in order to enact the recommendation as just discussed. Okay, yeah. all right, good. Just wanted to well, clarify that a little let bit. let me, th this one, this, this troubled me from the very beginning, this extension, because of what you said, Commissioner, we did five years and we did two, now we're doing two more. We did three. Three, two, three, and, three and two, two and two. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and now, we're, now we're, that's another extension. What really troubles me is the, the, the comment, what troubles me is the comment of a potential for a new hotel on that site. I mean, I'm not a hotelier. I'm not a uh, uh, evaluation, a person that can evaluate the best and highest use of property, but that seems to be, intuitively, that seems to be not a good idea. You're going to build it next to the uh, Aloft, and you're going to put another hotel. And then on top of it, I don't know if this be the case, but what the quality of the hotel is going to be put on that corner. That troubles me. And see, what we have now is they, if they want to change the PUD, they're going to it appears that they'll change the PUD for a hotel. I don't know if they're going to do that or not, but that's what it appears they're going to do. In 90 days, we're going to get a request to change the PUD to a hotel. And I, I, would, I have to say up front, that does not sit well with me. Okay? That is a signature corner in, the, in this community. And we need to think uh, what is the highest and best use of that signature corner. And maybe a hotel is there. Maybe that is a hotel, but I, I, it, it troubles me that we would put two hotels right next to each other, and that's what this amounts to, and we got the other hotel down there. I don't know how that affects the market or whatever the situation might be, but I'm willing to go along with the extension with an understanding that, you know, that PUD comes back before you. Come, I know it comes back before us, and uh, I will have additional comments at that point in time, depending on what the change to the PUD is. Commissioner Miller. Uh, Michael, could you elaborate on the parking situation and what an eventual movement forward on the part of the uh, McKibben group would mean to us as in terms of parking? Yes, ma'am. And just briefly, when, when this Originally, when this package was all put together um, back in 2008, um, the, when the office building was to be purchased, part of that, in order for that parcel to be developed, we will need to be put, a, a parking structure will need to be placed on the surface parking lot, which is owned by the CRA immediately behind the Aloft Hotel. So part of the entire development package will be, for the development of that site, will be come, uh, have to come back to the CRA for how their participation would be in helping build a parking structure on that site. 
Um, so right now, under our current lease agreement, we're, we're, we provide, we're required to provide 128 parking spaces to the Aloft Hotel. There's 103 parking spaces currently on that parking space, on that, that um, flat parcel. So if we, were, if we were to put another use on the um, with parcel A, we would have to come, basically come up with another 25 parking spaces um, approximately on that existing part, on that existing surface parking lot. Reality is, is whatever development goes on that corner is going to need parking as well. Right. And the assumption is, is that whomever we're developing or we're working with on that, they will be part of the negotiations and they will be leasing parking from the CRA as the Aloft Hotel is right now. And that will all be part of the funding scenario that would go into actually financing the construction of a parking structure. Commissioner Gillum. Yeah, when, when this does uh, come back, if there is a pr proposed change, you know, I would suggest bringing back what some of those original agreements were between us uh, that really spurred some of the incentive around this development. I remember um, this sort of the conversation like it was yesterday around not trying to incentivize stuff that was going to naturally happen. Um, one of the things that was appealing about this when it initially came through was the uh, facade sort of uh, being a little bit of a monument, not a monument, but certainly a replica of the old Floridan building. Um, the piece that faced uh, the intersection was, you know, very attractive. I mean, there were, there were pieces of this that made it seem very different in signature for the location. Right. If we are now backing away from that, then I think it's our obligation to remind ourselves of what was part. And even on the tr transportation piece, there was a Star Metro, huge, you know, uh, um, um, redesign of that uh, of that area that included parking and the bus port and the, you know, there, I think there was some federal money or, or something that we were attempting to go after or was involved. Actually, I think it still is involved in that land. We have federal money on that. Well, actually, what happened to remind you is is that there was. There was federal funds were used to purchase that property, and, and originally we were trying to do a design that would allow the, the ground floor to be used for buses. It just strictly, it really wouldn't work. But the the concern at that point was is that if we didn't use that for uh, a transportation purpose, the funds that we were provided to acquire it would have to be returned. So what the compromise was, we were able to work as um, FDO, uh, the our Department of Transportation at the federal level agreed that if the fair market value of that property was returned to Star Metro, they could reinvest that money into other uses. So the CRA purchased that parcel for $2.1 million. And then that money went to Star Metro, and they've been used. They used that to acquire a number of the satellite sites for theirs. So the design for the for the parking structure um, that it was adopted as part of the PUD does not include any multimodal functions in it. Now I, you may be correct in that. Part of the overall plan for the downtown shows some additional development on CK Steel. That wasn't really part of this PUD, yes, yes. but as this project evolved, the only way to make this work was we were, the CRA purchased the property, Star Metro used that those funds to reinvest them in the rest of the the um, the, uh, the transportation plan for their satellite sites and the parking structure that's being designed. In which you will see when you see the approved PUD, um, it's a four. I think it's a four-story parking structure. It, it's strictly for parking with some interactive uses on the ground floor. I I, I think you got a sense of where we are on this particular matter. Um, um, I think you got a sense of where. It, it seems to me we're going to have several opportunities ahead of us to make more decisions. So. Yeah. Yep, I agree. Uh, we have a motion and a second. All in favor of the motion, say aye. 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 It passes unanimously. Next item. The next item is 13.05, approval of the 2013 Transit Development Plan, minor updates. Commissioner Star Metro's Transit Development Plan is a federally required 10-year planning document that provides the overall guidance for transit in Tallahassee. A major update is produced every five years with a status report on the progress of goals and objectives from the TPD, TDP submitted to Florida Department of Transportation each year between the last uh, Met Star Metro major update to the TDP was in 2011. So what you have before you now is a minor update. Ivan Maldonado is here and uh, Brian Waterman is also here to provide a brief presentation to you on the minor changes that are being made. Go right ahead, Mr. Maldonado. 
Okay, uh, Brian Waterman is going to actually do the presentation. Please, Brian, come up. Brian. Again, good afternoon, Brian Waterman, Transit Planning Manager, Star Metro. This is the annual update to the Transit Development Plan. Uh, briefly, as a city manager, an uh, update on it is a federal and state requirement. We do a TDP every five years. Uh, this is the interim minor update we have to do annually. We have to do this in order to get our federal, our state block grant funds. The approval now, we'll come back, we'll do another approval in June for the block grant, and then August was one package to FDOT for their release of the block grant funds in September. Let me ask a question on that. This, is this part of CDBG funding or not? This is for DOT block grant funds for all the state transportation um, program. And it goes to the state and then comes to us? Then comes to us as part of our requirements. But it goes through the state? Yes. DOT. It's yes. Nice. And the project we identify in our TDP both make it to the local, our, our local priorities. It also goes on to the CRTPA Regional Mobility Plan and to the state transportation improvement program. So if we ever decide to do new service or new expansion areas, if we want any sort of federal or state funding, these projects must be identified in our transit development plan. Let me ask one other question. When it goes to the state, Ken, and the federal government is going to give a some block money to the state for this, correct? They give us a block grant which comes to us for operating assistance. That okay. general but operating assistance about this year is about $1.2 million. But it's a block grant that goes to the, to the state of $1.2 million for whatever. Uh, yes, it's a larger amount that goes to the state that's divided amongst, amongst the various districts and from the districts it comes to us, but yes. Uh, what I'm trying to figure out is the amount that comes to us is it designated at the federal level or is it, can it be changed at the state level? It's designated at the state level. It's, it's uh, formula funds based off our ridership, based off our mileage. It's, large, it's a lot of calculations that go into it that's just allocated based off the size of our agency. It's not something we can lobby to ask for a more or less amount. It's dependent on how we operate and how big we are. It's a formula fund. Okay. All right. All right. Thank you. Okay. Again, this is just an update from the last year where we talk about projects we've added, de uh, deleted, or progress on what we've done so far. Um, and we also include a fare box recovery ratio, and for the record, our fare box recovery ratio is one of the best in the state at 30 percent. Uh, the typical average fare box recovery ratio is about 15 to 20 percent. So we are doing really good, and lots largely attributed to our partnerships with FSU, FAMU, and TCC, and the good ridership we do have. Uh, completed or in progress, the alternatives analysis, we talked about the state of target issue, we come back possibly next month to move forward on the alternatives analysis, the consultant has been selected. Um, of course, we have, uh, back in December, the city commission acted, to, no, excuse me, back in November, the city commission acted to ex accept the grant to extend our service later into the evening, we have done that as well. We've also acquired the electric buses, they'll, they'll kick, it, kick off this summer. As for, um, and we also are in the process of installing very large fans at CK Steel Plaza as part of the re rehab there, which will help lower the ambient temperature and make the, the weight a much more pleasant experience in the heat of summer. As for additions and deletions, we have added single prioritization to 2018. I don't know if you're aware of this or not, we, there's a desire to upgrade our current uh, traffic operation system from the IR infrared based Opticon system to a GPS based system. As part of the going to a GPS based system, we can add single prioritization to our buses. So, in the event that a bus is operating is behind schedule, the green times or the red times at lights can be changed to bring the bus back on schedule. We are partnering with Public Works, Fire Department, and the like to do that. That is scheduled for 2018 due to the current capital uh, budget for the, for the city. And we've also deleted a park and ride facility from our project list, a little brief history on that. Uh, a couple years ago when we did the TDP, we had a proposal to do a park and ride lot in Midway in support of the Gadsden Express. We had some money set aside to do that, but that kind of fell through. Uh, we were unable to get the land we wanted, and FDOT was not willing to give up the right-of-way on US 90, so that project has been removed uh, from the list. And that is pretty much it. Uh, any other questions? Much. Okay. Questions? Comments? Uh, I guess we have to take action. You have to approve it. You have to approve it. Move approval. Second. There's been a motion and a second. All in favor of the motion to approve, say aye. 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 It passes unanimously. Next item. Next item, uh, Mr. Mayor, before we go to unagended speakers, I would like to ask Raul Lavin to come up and make a quick presentation that he'd like to make. Mm -mm. He didn't know I was going to say it this way, but he knew. He knew it was coming. Oh, he knew it was coming. Yeah. 
Thank you, Madam Manager. Uh, <laughs> good afternoon, Mayor and Commissioners. Just want to let you know that today is Kathy Davis's last uh, City Commission meeting. Uh, she is retiring after 25 plus years with the city and moving down to the Orlando area. So uh, today's her last meeting and actually Tuesday is her last day with the city and we'll be having a reception for her here at City Hall at two o'clock on Tuesday. Where's Kathy? She there she is. She's back Stand there. up, Kathy, so we can. Okay. <laughs> My office there didn't say a word. Mm. Didn't know at all. <laughs> <laughs> Mayor? Back in four years, watch. Some of you may recall that Kathy's husband, Sam Davis, was the director of our gas utility. And Sam moved on how many years ago, Kathy? Five years ago to Central Florida, oh. where he's the uh, director of the Apopka uh, utility there. They have been in route Kathy going every week or every other week, driving back and forth. And um, she has told us about three different times that she was going to retire because she could and, and make that move. And it's, we look up and it's been five years. And so she actually is going to make that move now. Uh, we'll, let, we'll, we'll let that one go, Kathy, for, the, for that reason. That's a great reason to retire. Sure. Okay, thank Commissioner. you. Commissioner. Yeah, I was, I was gonna ask what, what was going on, but. Uh, <laughs> Your motivations are clearer to me now. <laughs> I completely understand. Um, well, just a, a, a quick salute to you, Kathy, um, who has helped this commission engineer some of its ideas around local hiring practices. Um, uh, Kathy's been very uh, nimble, particularly during the tough economy that we've been through with, really trying to take our vision at the commission level of, of, of really getting deep in this hiring local and has created uh, public policy that I think helps to stand this test of legal push uh, and also um, represent the, the deep interests of this commission and so, and so much more. But uh, just want to say you are way too young to retire. <laughs> uh, um, uh, but we will absolutely miss you here. Thank you for your Thank work. Thank you, Kathy. Thank you. Next item. We are on unagended speakers. Are there any? There is one speaker, Mayor, Erwin Jackson. He's the only speaker. I think he knows the rules. I may have a second. Okay. Erwin Jackson, 1341 Jackson Bluff. Yeah. Commissioners, uh, city manager, a couple weeks ago, Commissioner Maddox tried to convince the public that information I have shared with the commission about John Marks was simply not true. I was also accused of crying wolf, quote unquote, and that no one was listening. This commission has for too long continued to support John Marks by remaining silent in the face of overwhelming evidence regarding his self-serving actions. The Florida Bar is listening. The Florida Bar informed me on April 10th, 2013, that after months of monitoring Mr. Marks, a formal investigation has now begun. The letter I've just passed out to you, I'd like to have placed into our public record. I would ask the city clerk uh, to certainly follow up with that. Mr. Mars, can you share with the public why the Florida Bar has opened this investigation? Yeah, it seems you will have another opportunity to explain to the public why your statements to the judge during your ethics trial do not agree with the written documents or your public statements. Justice moves slowly. However, eight members of the Florida Ethics Commission did not believe Mr. Marks when he stated he was unaware that Honeywell was a client of his law firm. Judge Stevenson ignored a signed document by Mr. Marks where he admitted that Honeywell was a client of his law firm. Instead, the judge simply chose to believe Mr. Marks' verbal testimony. Mr. Marks, at our last commission meeting, you asked if I thought you had perjured yourself during your ethics trial. I know that you lied to the public or Judge Stevenson or both regarding your relationship with Honeywell. It seems that the Florida Bar has questions regarding the accuracy of some of your statements. Therefore, I would suggest you ask them whether you cross the legal threshold for perjury. In closing, I do not believe an incumbent mayor has ever been investigated by the Florida Bar. It is truly disappointing that our local newspaper does not recognize this unfortunate action as newsworthy. Maybe they're right. 
The Florida Ethics Commission investigated our mayor, now the Florida Bar, and we continue to wait for the FBI to complete its work. So what else is new? <laughs> Thank you very much. You know, I actually can. Um, I just wanted to point out, um, my wife and I are going to be MCs this Friday night um, at um, Clement Plaza. It's a fundraiser. Uh, go right ahead, Mr. Marks. I'd love to uh, hear your question. I would love for you to sit down, please. Oh, I thought you said you had a question you for me. You sit down. Okay, thank you thank very you. much. Um, Hope Community, a fundraiser for the Hope Community. We discussed earlier today the, um, the need to um, support um, our Change for Change program in our utility to um, help um, a lot of our homeless children. And um, the Hope Community is a big part of um, serving the needs of the homeless community. So I would urge anyone that can come to the Fish Fry Friday night, please do so. Um, hopefully we'll entertain you to some degree and um, raise some money and do good things. Well, Thank I, you. I know of Gil's the great MCs. Thing. So, Mr. Mayor, Mayor, we do have Mr. one Mayor, other speaker. I only have one speaker at the time, but I do have a second speaker. Mm -hmm. Okay, Sorry. Oh. Uh, we do have a second speaker. You know, you know, it's, it's, it really is tempting to respond to Irvin Jackson, but it makes no difference. So, I won't. <laughs> you know, it, it, I won't. But he said nothing new at all. Next speaker. The next speaker is Ed Hollifield, and that's the only remaining speaker unless someone else brings me a form. <laughs> Ed Hollifield, 4032 Longleaf Court. Since I only have three minutes, I'm going to present the end of my speech first to make sure that it gets in. Uh, I'd first like to thank uh, uh, Nancy Miller, who sent me a, a very thoughtful note uh, praising my work in the community. I might add, I went into a state of shock because no politician has ever presented me with a thoughtful note. <laughs> um, what I'm here to speak about is something that's very um, important, um, hopefully to everybody. But on December 3rd, 2004, I sent a letter to the Tallahassee Democrat indicating that black infants in Leon County died at a rate of 53% higher than the state average. Unfortunately, uh, that situation uh, has con continued. We've had some lip service to the, pro to the uh, problem. The county started something called the HAIR Board, Health, Advis um, um, Health Advisory Board, which is now defunct. Uh, 2010 was astounding. That is, black babies in Leon County died at a rate of six times white babies, 18.3 for blacks, 3.1 for white per thousand, li per thousand live births. What should be done? Well, people tend to throw up their hands and say, this is too complex. We can't really do anything about this. And on a certain level, that's true. On a certain level, it's not true. There are some very simple things that could be done. And one would be to institute in a serious fashion breastfeeding, and that is not taking place in Leon County, unfortunately. There are a number of benefits. I'll start off with the reduction of it, the incidence of sudden infant deaths. Now, it has been demonstrated that breastfeeding can actually reduce that. Uh, in Leon County, black babies die from SIDS, sudden in infant death, 3.7 times the rate of white babies. In regard to breastfeeding, exclusive breastfeeding for six months, that's been signed off by the Surgeon General. It's been signed off by the American Academy of Pediatrics. Excuse me, your three minutes has expired. It's expired already? I asked for a one-minute extension. I think this is important. You too. Could you grab? Eric, go ahead. 
Doctor. Okay, the problem is this. Tallahassee Memorial continues to provide infant formula to mothers prior to discharge. That's a violation of the WHO code. It's a violation of UNICEF. That practice could come to an end immediately. We have talked to Mark, to, I've talked to Mark O'Brien about doing that. He could do it with a stroke of a, a stroke of a pen. When the infant formula companies parade their wares throughout the hospital, and when those discharge bags contain infant formula, it's a deterrent to breastfeeding. So much so that if you look at the Wick Center on the south side of town, only 6.5% of the babies are breastfeeding at six months, which is really the standard. I appreciate the extension of time, but I also submit that this is various, the very serious business, and I would try to convince the city of Tallahassee to adopt baby friendly with this focus on breastfeeding for the entire city of Tallahassee. That could be done. It would require TMH to push breastfeeding. It would require capital regional uh, to push breastfeeding. And there's at least a poss possibility that that would bring about a significant change in these abhorrent rates of black infant mortality that we see in Leon County. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hollifield. You know, I, Dr. Hollifield brings up obviously a point he's been addressing for a number of years in terms of infant mortality in this community. I wonder if this is a topic that we just approve the status of women. Mm -hmm. Would this be an appropriate topic for them to address? Um, I, I don't know. I don't know. Would this be some topic that they can address? And if they could, if it is, Dr. Hollifield, we just um, appointed some individuals to a commission on the status of women uh, here in, in the city of Tallahassee. It would appear to me that if they would, if they could take up this particular issue, it would probably have a lot more, it would have some weight, I won't say a lot more weight than what you're suggesting we do. And I don't know whether or not this is a topic that they would want to address, but it involves women. I think breastfeeding involves women, and this may be something that they could look, take a look at. And I would like to add that, um, actually, I started a parent child organization in Monroe, Louisiana, whenever I was in, having my children um, with two or three other people, and we did a lot of, a lot of education for people and encouraged people to nurse their children, um, explained the advantages, that kind of thing. And I don't know that we have anything like that here. I'm not working on that type of issue anymore, but that's something that was of interest to me now that you bring that up. The other thing, though, is that good prenatal care is extremely, extremely important for women. And as the budget for Healthy Start has been cut, They've had to cut back on the programming that they have. That, that is something that has disturbed me as I've seen it happen. I don't know what we can do because they are part of CHSP, but other than to, I am fully aware that they are cutting back and that we don't have as much emphasis on, on uh, good prenatal care or availability either in this community. So we'll have to discuss among the staff what we can do to address those things. Uh, let, me, let me comment a little bit further. I, I like what Dr. Hollifield is saying because my impression in the past we took kind of a shotgun approach. We tried a lot of different things. and and many different things into prenatal care, and I don't want those to you know, fall by the wayside. But what I think Dr. Hollifield is suggesting that this is one thing that's easy to implement in our community, and it gets results. That's what I hear him saying, and this is a focused kind of approach to this problem, rather than, okay, prenatal care, and talk to the doctors, and doing all that. I think that's what he's saying, and if that is the case, I think it makes, to me, it makes a lot of sense. That is not to say 
that we neglect the other things that can address this. But let's put some emphasis on this particular matter, and it could make a difference in those numbers. That's all I'm saying. I think that's what Dr. Hollifield is saying, and I, I have to agree with that. Okay, all right. With that, uh, we're on sharing about you. Commissioner. Chairman uh, Rodriguez. Well, one, on Dr. Hollifield's uh, point, um, this issue does seem so big and it's often difficult to pin <coughs> down what the uh, <coughs> substantial contributors are. And um, it seems like he's taking the right approach by talking to the hospital. I mean, we don't come across many babies uh, I mean, through the services we provide uh, directly from the city, but the hospitals come across practically all of them. Uh, and so uh, if, if there's some sympathy toward this issue toward the, at, at the hospital level, I mean, I think that's incredibly powerful. Mayor, I also like your suggestion around seeing whether or not this is something the Commission on, on Women's and Girls might be interested in uh, picking up on. <coughs> Uh, just quick uh, switching of gears. I was uh, approached by a, 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 a private roof builder uh, who had asked the question about um, why it is that I guess the county allows roofers to work over the course of the weekend by signing an affidavit that they will follow the w w building practices so on and so forth. And his point was uh, a lot of roofers would love to work over the weekends in the city, but apparently our uh, code folks don't go out over the weekends. And so they would, uh, or we have a prohibition on that or something along those lines. So I bring that up only um, to see if we can ex explore that question. Manager, I meant to bring it up to you earlier today, but it just hit me again uh, while we were sitting here. I don't know what the dynamics are around that, if it's restricted to the roofing folks or if this is something uh, more broader about uh, I'm not aware that we have any Jay, weekend can inspections can respond to that in terms of weekend we've been doing weekend inspections for since 1994 I had a comment by a builder mm -hmm. that was similar <coughs> so there's something something is something some there but this was this was a there. roof but it has something to do specifically probably Leon County just initiated a process where they are doing weekend inspections and maybe, in maybe he got it years. wrong he did say the county has been doing it for a long time. No, the county just started doing it. We have been doing it for a long time. Will you, okay. will you elucidate it? And that is correct, Madam Manager. We actually have had a program, I think, since uh, you, it is 1994, and we've mm -hmm. adjusted the fee for that program over the years. I think the last fee adjustment was in uh, 2004, if I recall correctly. Um, we actually, uh, our program is such that you actually have to call ahead to, to, to reserve an inspector to come on the weekend if you so desire them. So ours is a little bit different than the county's because theirs is on call. So you can <coughs> on call and have somebody actually come to your uh, place of business or your residence or whatnot on the weekend is what the county just implemented. Before they had a program where they basically they signed an, app, an affidavit that went with the permit because they didn't have, uh, my understanding, they didn't have enough uh, uh, inspectors actually come and catch all the roofs. So I think that's, I think that's the, the difference, that apparently they have an affidavit which allows work to continue over the weekend, and ours is you request an inspector over the weekends. And I'm trying to understand why the difference, what's the difference? That was their program before. So now, now, they, they, have a, now they have an on-call program where you can call a number after hours or on the weekends and an inspector uh, okay. would come to you. So no more do you sign an affidavit to continue work over the weekend. You now request an inspector for the weekend. Correct. It's an on-call inspector. Our program is we don't have an on-call inspector. You actually have to reserve that inspector. You have to okay. call. You have to make that appointment during the week, and there's a fee associated with that. I guess what I'm not hours. not clear on is um, whether there is a difference between signing an affidavit and continuing work over the weekend versus reserving an inspector who comes on site over the weekend. So, and you don't have to clear it. We can we can mm -hmm. sort of get to the bottom of it afterwards. Yeah. Uh, but I wanted to bring it up as okay. would love to, Commissioner. If you'd let us know. <clears throat> who the person is, maybe sure. we can contact them and see what the exact issue is. It sounds like there's something out there. Yeah. I, got a, I got one kind of a pet peeve that I observe quite a bit, and it's with leaf blowers. Leaf blowers. They blow the leaves into the street, from the grass into the street. It gets into the water system, and I don't think that's a good idea. 
And I don't know whether or not we have a way to present, prevent those gardeners and even homeowners from blowing the leaves and they get into the drain and it just really, in my opinion, is not something that we should allow. It doesn't seem right. And you can tell me whether or not it's okay. It may be a good thing. I don't know. But it doesn't appear to me to be a good thing at all. Yeah. And I just, every time I see one of these leaf blowers or gardeners blowing it in the middle of the street, they're in the middle of the street just blowing it and off the ground just blowing it. It does not seem to me to be a good thing. I wish we could take a look at that. I, I just don't like it. But anyway, anything else? Well, I just I wanted to thank um, Jim Cook, Lou Shelley, the city manager, and um, Rick, for, no, well, no, um, Jay Townsend for calling in this morning on, on WFSU. And did we miss somebody? Was there somebody? Lou Norvell. <laughs> Lou Norvell. Lou Norvell called, called in. Yep. Our acting auditor, I'm sure, called in after we left. Jim Cook <laughs> called in. Is there somebody in. that didn't call in? I'm just trying I to... I think maybe we didn't harass Tom Coe. We did. Uh, Tom, Tom Coe didn't call in. Anyways, you haven't, you haven't said what it's for yet. Uh, what are you, what are you, you said uh, WFSU, free public radio was the fundraiser. Call now. <laughs> it was a donation kind of a... No, yeah. we actually started the day at 7 o'clock together, so we're finishing it up here <laughs> numerous hours later. Um, and we... They're actually there. You can call now. Yeah, yes, they are. And and I was going to actually make a but it plug won't count for people to it'll call. Count to whoever's okay. there now. 414-1234. <laughs> 1-800-926-8809. I, I just think that, that is one of the most, the most wonderful assets that we have in this community is WFSU. And yeah. I know virtually everyone I know listens to it on the way to work and driving around the car. So we went out this morning from, from 7 and 8.30 and we had a wonderful time, but we were doing shout outs to all of you saying they should call, they should call, they should call during I the didn't time. hear the shout out, but I did get a text message. I won't <laughs> say from whom. Got to I, I was it. within okay. two minutes of the deadline. Yeah. Well, really? Well, wait a minute now. Jane and I do this every year, so oh, no. we got to save some time, save some of these calls <laughs> when Jane and I are on that. We do it we'll every, let you know. <laughs> yeah. every um, year. On I forgot goes to call to, you uh, folks here and, and tell y'all to call in, but I will I remember yeah, that the next time. You can harass time. everyone. Yeah. Okay. No, no, but it is a good Mark call. It goes to... Uh, Treasurer Clerk, who was the first city. Yes, no, he wasn't. No, Lou, Lou Norvell was the first was one. The he first. called right away. So but he was the first you, appointed Lou. official who called. You think somebody trying to get some brownie points? Thank you all for doing that. Yeah, thank you for the support. <laughs> thank, all right, it is, a good, it is a good program. It is good. I'm glad you called in this morning. we got to keep NPR, especially on the morning drive on, on, the, uh, on the air. <laughs> call now. I want to make two other comments. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. If you're not, I just hang on one second. First of all, we have a budget meeting tomorrow night. Uh, I was out of town in Chicago, actually, with the Star Metro folks last week, and I couldn't come, but I heard such stories of your antics that I <laughs> changed know. my plan and That's realized it was very really important to, to go because you've involved us more than just yeah. window dressing. Let's we'll announce what time the budget. It is. If you'll give me a chance, I will. It's at Good Shepherd tomorrow night um, on Thomasville Road between 6 and 7.30, so I'd like to invite everybody, especially people in the Northeast, since it's near them, to come to that. And I also wanted to... Um, basically take note of the fact that we're actually bringing in a lot of projects for a landing. I mean, last week we opened Franklin Boulevard, this week Mayhem Drive, and I'm maybe getting these times wrong, but yeah. bottom line is that once a week, and then tomorrow at 10 o'clock we're going to be opening another part of the second phase of Gaines Street. So we are trying to get these things done. I know everybody's inconvenienced by the, the all the construction that's been going on, but by the end of the year when we celebrate this next new year, there are going to probably be a lot fewer orange barrels around for you to have to maneuver. So. I thought I've just been very excited about All that. All right. Thank you for that. Thank you for reminding everybody that those things are going to happen within this year. And they are. We're looking forward to it. I don't, unless y'all want to share something else, we're staying adjourned. Thank you. Thank you. have been in a supervisory capacity, a master's degree in engineering, or an MBA degree combined with an undergraduate degree in engineering may be substituted for one year of the required experience. 
or an equivalent combination of training and experience is acceptable, provided that the applicant possesses registration, 